resurrection. This is what it is all about. He is risen. This is so exciting. What a better day to be preaching than on Easter Sunday, but also, I got to be honest, preaching on Easter Sunday is a little difficult because you guys know what's coming, right? Like, <laughs> spoiler alert, it's posted everywhere. Everyone's saying he is risen. Everyone knows what's about to happen. You know the story that's about to happen. I'm probably not going to catch anybody by surprise this morning. Uh, and, and all over the world, all over the globe, pastors will be preaching about this same story all over the earth, which is kind of cool to think about, that all together the earth will be shouting in the joy of the resurrection this morning. And so this morning I want to look at is, is what does this mean for us? Why is it 2,000 years after this event, we still come together every week, not every week, well, but kind of every week, but every year we celebrate this day, the resurrection of Jesus, and all over the globe, we, we, we celebrate this day. Why is it that, that we still celebrate this, and what does this resurrection mean for us here today? What does the resurrection mean for you and I today? And we were just singing about the power of Christ, of standing in the power of Christ, and the title of my message today is The Power of a Resurrected Life. The Power of a Resurrected Life. Because the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the most important, most significant moment in our history. This is the, the biggest moment ever. And the way that you respond to this resurrection is the most significant decision you will ever make in your life. So this morning we're going to go through this story, and we want to start back at the beginning, not at uh, the resurrection, not at the cross, not even at Palm Sunday, but going all the way back to page one. If you flip open that first page in the Bible, going to the story of creation right there in Genesis, because the, the key to understanding the cross it starts with creation. The deeper understanding we have of creation, the more richness it brings to the cross. So in the beginning, we see that God created the heavens and the earth, right? He made this beautiful world. He made everything in it. Think of the most beautiful places you've been in your life. And God spoke all of that into existence. How wild, how crazy. He is just speaking. And day after day, he is making this world just by speaking it all into existence. And then it comes time to create mankind. And God did something different. He did not just speak and say man and there was man. He did something different. He handmade this man from the dust of the earth. He formed this man. And then he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. So this man was completely different than the rest of creation. Day after day, he's just speaking it all and it's all just coming to be. But then he stops and he hand makes this man from the dust of the earth. And we know the story of Eve. When he created Eve, he, he put Adam into this deep sleep. He took out one of his ribs and he handmade woman. So Man was handmade by God, but there was also something more significant than just the fact that he handmade mankind, it's that speaking it, is that he made man in his image and in his likeness. And this is that significance that I want to capture. This moment right here, that God created mankind in his image and in his likeness. So mankind was completely different, distinguished from creation. We were not just another animal. We were not just the smartest animal. We were completely different. We were made different, and we were made in his image and his likeness. Mankind is the centerpiece of creation. And then God gave dominion to mankind, dominion over the earth to rule over it. He gave that dominion to mankind. And God lived in this perfect relationship with mankind. And it is awesome. It is beautiful. Now, right here, a lot of times it's like, well, how, how do we know? Right? This whole resurrection thing, how do we know this actually happened 2,000 years ago? That's a long time ago. How do we know these things actually happen? How do we know that there's really a God out there? Well, we can prove it right from the very first pages of the Bible. First of all, anything that has a design has a designer, right? If I told you this watch this morning on my wrist, you said, hey, that's a nice watch. Where'd you get it from? And I say, craziest thing happened. One day, I hear this pop, poof, and I looked, and there's my watch. What would you guys say? 
you're crazy. Like, we're, <laughs> we're institutionalizing this guy. No way. That did not happen, right? But, I mean, it's kind of easy. Like, a, a, a watch compared to the complexity of the universe, right? So we look at the design of the universe, of how everything works, to look if we, are, like if we were a little bit closer to the sun, how we would just get roasted. If we're a little bit further away, we just freeze and die. You think about the complexity of the human anatomy, the eye, and all the colors we see, and we would say, oh, surely you're crazy if the watch just popped up. But yeah, the universe, I don't know. It was a big bang or something wild happened. Or, it's crazy, right? You would put me in an institution, in an institution if I said my watch appeared, but we looked at the complexity of the universe and just say, well, surely <laughs> it just happened, right? It's insane. Anything that has a design as a designer, that's just common logic. And the second thing is that fact that we were created in the image and the likeness of God, right? And so let me show you how this proves the existence of God. If, if I were to murder someone, everyone in this room would condemn it, right? That is a bad thing to do, right? We do not murder people. Just about everyone on earth would agree with that, right? There's this, there's this something inside of us, this common morality that, that human life has importance, and you do not kill people. You do not hurt people. You don't take people's lives. We would all, all condemn that, right? But day after day, lions kill gazelles, right? And no one bats an eye at that, right? It's just the circle of life. Oh! Right? <laughs> it's the circle of life, right? That's because man was made in the image and the likeness of God. If we weren't, then there is no morality. If I am bigger and stronger than you, then I can take dominion over you and I can kill you. But it's like, whoa, no, no, you can't say that. Can't. Of course not, because we were created in the image and in the likeness of God. So we see it right there from the Garden of Eden, right there at the beginning. So God creates this perfect world, everything in it. He creates mankind, the centerpiece of his creation, in his image, in his likeness, and he lives in this perfect relationship with them. It is just this beautiful world, completely free of pain, free of hate, free of death. Everything that we hate about this world is completely there because there was no sin. And they lived in a garden, so there was a lot of trees. There's a lot of different trees, and these trees gave them life. They didn't have to work. They just woke up, and they're, they're strolling around naked, and life is good, and just eating all the fruit they want. They don't got to go to work. It's like, you know, 24-7, 365, all-inclusive vacation. You know, all their needs are met. They are living, and it is good. So amongst these trees, there was two trees that were particularly unique. There's the tree of life, and then there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so God gave them free range to eat from any tree in the garden except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's one rule. There's one rule. <laughs> how, life, how sweet is life where there's one rule? You don't got to go to work. You're never going to get sick. You're never going to get hurt. You're never going to die. Life is good. Everything is provided for you. All you have to do is not eat from one tree. Obviously, we know that they failed. But it's almost like, hey, why, why would God, why would you make this one rule? Why, like, why not just, like, block off that tree? Don't let them get to it. Well, it's because we were created with free will, that we were not forced into this relationship with God, right? Can you imagine if, like, as a kid, you found out that all your friends were just your friends because your parents were paying them to be your friends? Like, how terrible <laughs> that would feel, right? Like, that would be, right? So, but we weren't forced into this relationship with God, that we were not just these robot bots that were programmed to love and to serve this God, but we have free will. And God loved us, and he cared for us. He provided for us, and we lived in this relationship with him, but we weren't trapped. We weren't forced into this relationship, and man had a choice. There's the choice, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Ultimately, you know that mankind failed, that Eve ate the fruit. She gave it to her husband, and this is the moment that we call the fall, because this is the moment where the perfect world was destroyed. This is where we lost that perfection because sin entered the world. The things that we hate about the world, the cancer and the injustice and the sickness and the death and divorce and hate and division and all these things floods into the world when sin enters the world. So this perfect world where God lived in perfect relationship with mankind was lost in this moment where they chose sin. They chose to rebel against God. They chose to break that one 
rule. And this moment was huge because it meant that they would be separated from that perfect relationship with God. There's two things that happened in the garden. They, they, they suffered this spiritual death, this separation from God. And this plague of sin has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And here we are. We are all born into this world with a sinful nature. We all come into this world as sinners. Just as Romans 3:23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, in the garden we lost that perfect relationship with God that we were created for. We were created to live in that oneness with God, to live in relationship with him. And the second thing that happened is it meant that they would also die a physical death. So they died a spiritual death, and they would also eventually die a physical death. They were cut off from the tree of life, and they would eventually die because God did not want us to go on living like this. This is not what it is about. This is not the garden anymore. So when you look at the world and say, this isn't right, it's not fair, is it? Exactly. That is exactly right. Why would God allow this? Why would God allow that? No, no, no. It's because we're not in the garden anymore. This is not what we were created for. We were created for a relationship with God, and we were created for eternity. And in the garden, when sin came in, those two things were robbed from us. We lost what we were created for. And so as you follow along through the Bible, we see man's attempts at trying to, to make their way back to the garden, to try and earn their way back into that relationship with God. If I can only do good enough, and time and time again, they fail because we cannot meet the standard. We cannot achieve righteousness on our own. And so God had a plan. Despite the fact that we were the ones who messed up the beautiful, perfect world that he created, he didn't just turn his back on us and say, I'm going to go start a new world over here. I can't believe you guys did this. There was one rule. Look what you did to my perfect creation. He still loved us. And that's where Jesus comes in. For hundreds of years, these prophets wrote about how God would send a redeemer to come in and rescue his people. Over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at the utter ridiculousness of how detailed these accounts are and how we have the physical copies of this, that this is not some make-believe, made-up story, that, but it is proven. You can date it. It is all there. And Jesus, if he is not truly God in the flesh, there's no way this happens. There's no way this happens. So these prophets told of this redeemer who would come. So Jesus came into the world to do the thing that you and I could not do, to live a perfect life, and then give that life up on a cross. So last week, we, we looked at the, the, the moment where Jesus was arrested, and then he goes through these trials. And how it's this totally ridiculous story that, when you look at it, it, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. How do you take a perfect man who has done nothing wrong, he has done nothing wrong, and then take that man and somehow sentence him to death? We're going to give this man the death penalty. It doesn't make any sense. We looked at the story of how under the darkness of night he went through these, these uh, illegal botched trials and b amongst the religious leaders who sentenced him to blasphemy, and then they brought him to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, to, to, to you got to put this man to death, and how they, they tried to paint him as this rebellious leader, this insurrectionist that was going to lead this rebellion against Rome. And, but Pilate looks on, it's like, there's no, nothing here, there's no evidence of this, but the, but the mob demands his death, and eventually Pilate Pilate caves to the mob, and he orders Jesus' execution. And we looked at how the story does not make any sense in the absence of a sovereign God. Because Jesus was a perfect man. You can't sentence a perfect man. You can't find guilt in him because it was our guilt. It was your guilt. It was my guilt that Jesus was sentenced to death for. It was our guilt that he carried to that cross. And we looked, and John 10, verse 18. I got you on the clicker on, sorry. <laughs> Jesus said, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. No one took Jesus' life. No one took Jesus' life. He at all times held the authority to do whatever he wanted. It wasn't that, oh, well, he was sentenced to death. There's nothing they could do about it. No, no, no. There's this moment 
where he speaks and he knocks all the soldiers to the ground with, with two words. He had authority over all of it. He is in control of everything that has happened. His life was not taken from him, but he laid it down for us. He laid it down for you. Jesus was brutally flogged. He was beaten. He was spit on, a crown of thorns placed on his head, and he was hung on a cross, and he suffered the most excruciating death imaginable, all while having the authority to stop it at any moment. Being in complete control the whole time, could have called down legions of angels to rescue him, could have done anything. He has authority all over everything. This is the guy who told storms to shut up, and they did. <laughs> He has authority over it all, but he took this beating, being whipped, a crown of thorns placed on his head, being executed in the most excruciating way humanly imaginable. The question is, how, how didn't he give up? I mean, I get a little ouchy, and I'm like, ah, no, ow, like, you know, please stop, rescue me, anything I can do to get myself out of pain. But Jesus took this pain. Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured that wicked, brutal punishment on our behalf, for the joy that was waiting on the other side, the joy of having a relationship with us again the joy of being able to take our sin off of us, to remove our guilt. It was for the joy set before him that he endured that cross. So he went to the cross, he suffered this brutal death, and he died. They made sure of it. They, they, he was hanging there, and, 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 and if you were here on Friday night, we talked about how typically they would go around and break the legs of the criminals, right? This is what you did in a crucifixion. But for some reason... When they got to Jesus, they found he was already dead, so they decide not to break his legs. This is weird. What? This is so unusual, but like the prophet said hundreds of years ago, that not one of his bones would be broken. So rather than breaking Jesus, which was the custom of doing, is what they did every single time, they decide they're going to stab him with a spear. Pretty wild. So they decide to stab him with a spear, and out comes water and blood. They drained him of every source of life. And this is done in the public square for all to see. This has all happened in front of everyone. Everyone watched him die. He was stabbed with a spear. There's, his body is drained of all life. So there's not like this, maybe they just like got him really good, and then they took him off when he had a little bit of life. They let him rest for three days, and then he was able to knock out the tomb. No, he was dead. Everyone saw him. Everyone, they drained the blood from his body. So then Jesus' body was t turned over to this man, Joseph of Arimathea. And we don't know a ton about this man, Joseph of Arimathea, but we know that he was a religious leader. He was part of the Sanhedrin, and he had kind of secretly became a disciple of Jesus. And he was one of the very few men amongst the Sanhedrin that actually opposed putting Jesus on the cross. So the, one of the few men who opposed uh, sentencing Jesus to death. And the Bible also says that he was a wealthy man, and it says that he was a good and a righteous man. And so... The body of Jesus was turned over to Joseph of, of Arimathea, and he put Jesus into his family's tomb, and a stone was rolled at the entrance. But because of the rumors of what this Jesus may do or how wild his followers may be, they rolled this stone in front of the tomb, and they sealed it, and they put guards in front of it. They did not want some kind of wild, crazy thing happening where something happens. They're going to come in. They're going to steal his body. They're going to claim, look, he's not here. He was resurrected. So they, they, they seal it. They guard it. They make sure no one is getting to Jesus. And the next few days were dark. Jesus, the light of the world, was removed from the world. It seemed that all hope was gone. The man that the disciples had surrendered their life and everything to follow after this guy committed everything to him, and now he's gone. They watched him die, his life taken from him, and then he's put into a grave, and it seemed that all hope was lost. They had abandoned their lives to follow Jesus, and now it seemed like, is all hope lost? Have we wasted our lives here? But luckily, the story doesn't end here, because if the story does end here, indeed, they were hopeless, and you and I were hopeless, and they had wasted their lives. But the story goes on in Matthew 28. 
It says, after the Sabbath had dawned on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, Sunday. you can say it a little louder. <laughs> Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that's Jesus' mother, went to, went to look at the tomb, and there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. He, here the guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. Imagine the scene. <laughs> the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. How awesome this, this moment where Jesus is resurrected. And this was no gimmick. There was no trick to this. He hung before everyone. They stabbed him with his spear. The, the, all life drained from his body. Everyone saw that he was dead. He was placed in that tomb. It is days later. And he came and he lived amongst them. It wasn't like a Mary and Mary went and they're like, hey, he's gone. And then no one ever saw him again. No, he came out and he hung out with them for more than a month. He's just wandering around. It's Jesus for all to see. There's no gimmick here. This is history, and, and there, there's this moment. I, I know that we've talked about religion a lot this morning, and maybe this is your first time around here, and, and maybe all the religious talk is making you uncomfortable, so I figured we'd take a break and talk about politics. Maybe that would make you feel a little better. Uh, <laughs> does anyone know the name Charles Colson? Or maybe Chuck Colson. He usually went by Chuck. Yes. So Chuck Colson was a special, special counsel to President Nixon, and uh, he was put in prison for his role in the Watergate scandal. And while he was in prison, he surrendered his life. He made Jesus his Lord and Savior. He began following Jesus. He ended up becoming an evangelist. And he wrote this about the resurrection, which is so cool. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. And they then proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Right, so this, there's no gimmick here. This is a real story. The resurrection of Jesus is a reality. It is recorded, and it is there. We have the testimonies. We have the receipts to prove it. And so I started with these questions of what does this mean for us 2,000 years later? What does the resurrection mean for us today? 1 Peter 1, verse 3 through 5 says this, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that never perishes, spoils, or fades. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who, through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Through the resurrection of Jesus, we are offered a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus, we are offered a, the joy of a relationship with him again. We are offered a peace that surpasses understanding. We, we are offered power over our sin, that we are no longer slaves, but we are sons and daughters, and we're no longer powerless, just enslaved to our sin, unable to do anything about it. But we are given freedom we are offered purpose in life. We are offered security for eternity. This is the power of a resurrected life. This is what Jesus offers us. He offers us a resurrection. So the death and the resurrection of Jesus is an invitation for us to come and die and also be resurrected. Now you're here for the first time, you're, just you're like, oh man, what is this? Some sort of, sort of cult we got ourselves in. What is this guy talking about to come and die? This is getting a little creepy here. Let me explain what I mean. <laughs> Luke 9 verse 23 says this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, just as Jesus took up that cross. And he, he went 
and he suffered and he died for us. He took our shame. He took our guilt. So this, this death that I'm not talking about is not, a, is not a physical death because thankfully Jesus did that part for us. But it's denying ourselves. It's letting go of our lives. We must first die to ourselves. We have to let go of this life, the life that we have, the life of sin, the life that we were never intended for. We have to let go of that. We have to surrender that. Galatians 5 verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Just as Jesus was crucified, we have to crucify the flesh. We have to crucify this life we have. If, if, if we want to live a resurrected life, what has to happen first? What comes before a resurrection? A death. That's right. Dead things are resurrected. So we have to first die. We cannot take hold of the life that Jesus has for us while we're still holding on to our old life. We got to let one go. We got to crucify it. We got to leave it behind. We got to deny ourselves to take up a resurrected life. Matthew uh, 10 verse 39 says, if you cling to your life, this is Jesus, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give it up, your life for me, you will find it. If you try and cling to this life, just try and hold on to it, you're going to lose it. You, can, you can't earn your way back and you, can, you, cannot, you can't do this yourself. You can't say, well, I'm, I'm, I'll go to church. I'll do the things. I'll be a nice person. We have to let go of our lives. It starts with the death. It starts with the death of us so that we can receive the resurrected life that Jesus has in store for us. You can only have one life. You only get one. You can't hold on to the other one and get the one that God has for you. This is one of my pa favorite passages from the Bible right here. It's Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. But... Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved, and God raises up with and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to the to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. I love that. It kicked off by saying, you were dead because of your sin, because of your transgressions, because we were all sinners, you were dead. So we're talking about dying, right? You're already dead. It's a dead life you got. You might as well let it go. You were dead because of your sin and transgressions. And that is the power of the resurrection. That is the power of the gospel. It's not that like, hey, we were kind of bad and Jesus came so that you could be good and you stop, stop doing bad things. Don't say swear words anymore. Like, no, this is a resurrection. This is you were dead and you can be made alive through Christ. This is, this is such a huge thing. It's not just good and bad. It's, it's you were dead and Jesus came to give you life. Without Christ, all of us are dead. We are slaves to our sin, and we are powerless to do anything about it. We are all completely and utterly hopeless. Verse 3 says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's a tough reality. This is the cup that we were talking about as Jesus prayed in the garden. If there's any way that this cup can pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. That wrath that we were deserving of, Jesus took that cup. Jesus carried it to the cross. So this is the bad news here. By nature, we were deserving of death. Verse 4, there's a big but. Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> but, what a great word. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with 
Christ, when we were dead in our transgressions. You were dead, you were hopeless, you were powerless, you were a slave to your sin, but there is a God who loves you. There is a God who loves you despite the fact you were dead, despite the fact that you were a sinner, despite the fact that by nature we were deserving of wrath. That's who we were, but God still loved us. That is some good news right there. He still loved us. The verse that I'm sure this is the one that's not going to catch anyone by surprise. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I'm sure you guys have heard it a million times. Tim Tebow used to write it on his face. It's the most Googled Bible verse of all time. But think about the power of those words. Consider the bad news. Consider what we lost in the garden, the bad news that we were, we were broken, we were hopeless, we were lost, we were dead in our transgressions, but God loved you. And he sent his son Jesus into the world to take a cross for you so that through him you shall not perish. Those are big words, shall not perish perish but have eternal life this is the power of a resurrected life if the son has set you free you are free indeed and while your body may eventually suffer a physical death you will live forever in eternity with christ we can find our way back to the garden to the life that was robbed from us by our sin and it's through the resurrection of jesus all of this happened because that wrath we were talking about, Romans 6, 23, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There was a price to be paid for our freedom. There was a price to be paid to atone for the sin of the world. We started in Genesis this morning. I want to throw back to Genesis one more time before we finish up. It's a story from Genesis chapter 29. Maybe you're fam familiar with this, of a, a story of a man named Jacob. And like any good story, he was in love with a lady. So Jacob, he had traveled and he, he went to work with a man named Laban. And Laban had this daughter named Rachel. And, and, and Jacob fell in love with Rachel. And so when Laban came and asked him, what is, what is your wage? You're coming to work for me. What is your wage? He said, I'll work for you for seven years to marry your daughter. Oh, how sweet. Here's the sweetest part. They agree on it. And it says that because of his love for her, the seven years felt like only a few days. <laughs> Isn't that just beautiful? Well, if you know how the story goes, Jacob gets, gets fooled pretty bad and ends up marrying Rachel's older sister, Leah. And oh, he's in love with this girl. He gets really, I, I was in love with the girl who worked for him for seven years, but he still loved her so much. The father said, well, he, she's my oldest daughter. She had to be married first. He said, I'll work for you for another seven years. I love this girl so much. So he works for, for this man for 14 years to pay the wage to make Rachel his bride. The wage of sin is death. There's a price that had to be paid because of our sin, and so Jesus paid that price. He took the punishment that we deserve. He took your guilt. He took my guilt. He took our shame. And he went to that cross. He was sentenced in our place. And he died our death. Jesus was the son of God. He was 100% God, 100% man. He was born into this broken world that had their, our backs turned to him. And he came and he lived a perfect, sinless life something that I never could do, something that you could never do. And then he gave up that life on a cross. He took the most humiliating, most violent, excruciating death possible. And he did it all willingly, having the authority to, to, to stop it at any moment. But it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured that cross. Because of his love for you, he endured that cross. And on that cross, he paid our wage. He, he, he took our place and uh, he took that cross and he went into the tomb and he rose up three days later with a check in his hand and he handed it to God the Father and says, I have paid the wage. I have purchased my bride. 
Jesus endured more than anyone could ever dream of because of the joy that was set before him, the joy of inviting you into a relationship with him, the joy of offering you eternal life, the joy of saving you from the slavery of your sin, the joy of offering you freedom, the joy of giving you a resurrected life. And so the question this morning is, have you been resurrected? Have you been resurrected? This is the question that we are all confronted with this morning, Easter 2022. Please don't leave this room this morning if you have any questions about it without being absolutely certain. We have some people on hand in these back rooms here that if you want to ask any questions or you need some prayer, they would love to talk with you. So the question I need to ask each and every one of us this morning is as we leave this room today, are you leaving as a slave or are you leaving as a son or daughter of the king? Are you leaving powerless or are you leaving powerful? Are you leaving in bondage or are you leaving in freedom? Are you leaving in grief or are you leaving in joy? Are you leaving hopeless or with a living hope? If you're here this morning and you're ready to receive that resurrection, saying, man, I know that I am hopeless. I have run to the things of this world that has brought me no joy. I've chased after all that life has to offer it. I find no purpose. Never, no matter how much money I make, I can't seem to feel secure. It was all robbed from us in the garden. And Jesus offers that life back to us. He offers us spiritual life. Life abundantly and life for eternity. And the good news is that it's really simple because Jesus did the hard part. He took the cross. So for us, it just starts with confessing, I'm a sinner, I get it. I'm powerless over my sin. There's nothing that I can do about it on my own. I need a Savior. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you declare with your, your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so this morning, please hear me. I'm not attempting to do some sort of cheap or counterfeit altar call for the sake of numbers or anything like that. I'm not trying to make some phony emotional appeal so we can post it on Facebook or anything like that. I've told you the real cost of following Jesus, that it starts with the death. I'm not sugarcoating it and saying it's all rainbows and butterflies and, 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 and all that stuff, but I, I plead with you to please examine the reality of the situation. And I can tell you my testimony that Jesus transformed my life, that I was hopeless and he gave me hope and I was completely joyless and he transformed it. He resurrected my life and replaced it with a life that overflows with joy and he offers the same to you. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in that resurrection, you'll be saved. So this resurrection that we celebrate year after year, it is the most important moment in the history of the earth. And how do you respond? Because your response is the most important decision that you will ever make. And let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that while we were sinners, you died for us. That we didn't have to earn our way back, even though we were the ones responsible for destroying the perfect world that you created for us. You came and you loved us, you served us, you lowered yourself, you humbled yourself. You lived a perfect life, and then you took my guilt you took my shame and you went to that cross and you endured an excruciating punishment for the joy that was set before you. The joy of having a relationship with us again, of freeing us from the bondage of our sin and giving us freedom and giving us the power of a resurrected life. This morning, if you're here with every eye closed, every, every head, head, head is bowed, no one's looking around the room. This is just between you and Jesus right now. If you're here this morning, maybe maybe you've, maybe this isn't your first time in church. Maybe you've done the church thing for a while, but you said, man, I, I'm st <laughs> I don't have that resurrected life. I 
done the Jesus thing. I've come to the church, but there's no power in my life. There's no power over my sin. I want to receive that power of the resurrection this morning. Or if you're here this morning and you can say, I know that I am hopeless, I am broken, and I need a Savior. And this morning, I want to let go of my life to receive the life that God has in store for me. I want to die to myself. I don't want to cling to this life anymore. I want to let go of it, surrender it, and receive a powerful resurrected life. If that's you this morning, would you just, no one's looking around, would you just slip a hand up so we can see this morning? Awesome. See that? Awesome. 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 Praise God. This morning, I want to, if you just slipped your hand up, I want to invite you to pray with me just in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud, and there's no magical prayer <laughs> that, that gets you saved or anything like that. Just like Romans said, we just confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in his resurrection, and we will be saved. But this morning, I want to give you a time just to, to connect with God and to signify that surrendering of the life and allow him to give you that resurrected life. If you're here and you just slipped your hand up, would you just pray with me? Jesus, thank you for going to the cross. I know that I am a sinner. Thank you for taking the punishment that I deserved. Thank you for paying my wage. I surrender my life. I make you my Lord. I accept you as my savior. I will follow you for the rest of my life. If you're here this morning, your life has just been resurrected. The old is gone, the new has come, and you have received a powerful life and resurrection. Please don't be quiet about that. Please grab someone this morning and let them know that you made that decision to follow Jesus. And if you're in this room and there's there's something that you want to talk about, there's something heavy on your heart, or maybe you feel that tug at your heart, but you're just not quite ready, maybe you have some questions, please, the band's about to play one last song. If you would just come on these doors on the side. We have some people back there that would love to talk with you, would love to pray with you. They're not going to press you into making any decisions, but they just want to be there to answer any questions or pray for you. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the reason that we have to celebrate, that we were once hopeless, but now we have a living hope, that we were once joyless, but now we are offered a life that overflows with joy. God, we thank you that through you we can receive the life that was intended for us, the life that was robbed from us by sin. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We give you the glory and we thank you for your death and we praise you and glorify you for that resurrection. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.